evening, everybody. My name is Gary Reeves. I'm a master flight instructor. I'm also the uh, chief safety officer with the Pilot Safety Institute. Thank you so much for attending tonight's webinar. Before I introduce tonight's guest speaker, I would like to tell you about one of our key sponsors and uh, a company that makes many of our free classes and handouts possible is the Flying Aviation Expo. Many of you will know the large national expos that AOPA used to do. Um, that's been taken over by Flying Magazine for Palm Springs this year. And it's going to be bigger and better than ever. There's a Ferrari test track and uh, Hangar One Vodka and a much bigger show with a much uh, larger education uh, component. In fact, Pilot Safety and I will be speaking twice at the show, once on Friday on how to teach with iPads, and on Saturday, the top 25 mistakes that pilots make. We'll have a full-time booth there. Mike Jesh, our speaker tonight, and an airline captain will be there. We'd love to have you come by. After tonight's show uh, webinar, you will receive a survey link in a couple hours after the show. If you complete the survey, I will actually email you a link that is a free uh, registration and save you $55. So we would love to have you. As this, again, the Pilot Safety Institute is the parent nonprofit that makes all of this possible. And uh, we certainly uh, appreciate all of your support. There are many free online resources if you go to pilotsafety.org, including a chance to talk to Mike, myself, air traffic controllers, aviation attorneys, and aviation medical examiners for free. There are free recorded webinars, and you can even buy some of our uh, other webinars on DVD or make a donation, and we would certainly appreciate all of your help. So tonight's webinar is, hello, my name is Airspeed. And tonight's uh, guest lecture, also a master flight instructor. If you don't know what a master flight instructor is, there are 97,000 flight instructors in the United States. Only 15 masters uh, reside in California, and there are only about 800 nationwide. So we're very lucky to have him. He's an airline transport uh, pilot, a CFI I MEI. He's a lead fast team representative here in Southern California with myself. He owns a beautiful Cessna 182 at Fullerton, and he's a true expert in Garmin Avionics, the Cessna 182, and flying with the iPad. I'd like to have everybody please welcome Mike Josh. Before I hand it over to him, if you have a question, please use the questions feature, and all of you will receive a link uh, tomorrow with a uh, YouTube video of this that you can watch again anytime you wish. So everybody here is Captain Mike. Thanks Gary. Good evening everybody. Good to be talking to you from sunny Southern California. And uh, I'm going to start out with a little introduction to the WINGS program. Uh, you probably are at least loosely aware of this already if you've signed up for this program. Uh, as an airline pilot, it's uh, I'm very used to doing recurrent training on a regular basis, and that's basically what the WINGS program is for general aviation pilots. So the, the program changes from time to time as we find that the accident record changes, we need to focus on some different issues. Uh, the best part is that you as the pilot uh, get to choose which activities you do. Now, there are some requirements, some types of things you have to do, but there's an element of it that's up to you. So. It, if you accomplish and complete the phases of the flight review or the uh, wings program rather that resets your flight review clock so you don't have to worry about getting that BFR in your logbook but most importantly it helps you be a better safer pilot the wings program is administered by the fast team that's the FAA safety team and there's a fast team in each FISDO around the country it's an out educational outreach program of the FAA and it's composed of local volunteer pilots, flight instructors, and anybody who has an interest in aviation safety. So tonight we're going to talk about the airspeed indicator. Uh, you might think it's a fairly simple instrument, and it is, uh, but there's a lot to it. We're going to talk about examples, some legalities, how does it work, different kinds of airspeed, 
uh, V speeds that you'll see on and off your airspeed indicator and uh, different ways that it can fail that have caused some pilots to come to grief. Might be aware of the famous Bill Kirshner, his famous saying about lose not thy airspeed lest the ground rise up and smite thee and indeed that's true. So let's learn a little bit about airspeed tonight. This is the neighborhood you're used to and uh, you see up there in the upper left corner is the airspeed indicator. That's the one we're talking about. Very important part of your six pack flight instrument if you fly, fly a steam gauge airplane. We're going to start out with some history and examples of the airspeed indicator. Uh, the, the first airspeed indicator that used air pressure to measure it was invented by this man, Alexander Ogilvy. He was the seventh pilot licensed in England. He bought a Wright Flyer, had it shipped over to England, taught himself how to fly it, and uh, just a couple years after that, invented the airspeed indicator. And that's a, a picture of it, the best picture I could find on the right-hand side there. So we'll start out with some examples here. Now this is a very simple airspeed indicator. It's off of a hang glider. And you can see down there at the bottom, the tube comes in and that's where your pedo or your ram air pressure comes in. The top of it is open to the atmosphere. And you can see that little red disc there at about 35 miles an hour. That just shows where the balance point is between these two. As you accelerate, it pushes that red disc up and you see a higher airspeed. Very simple, you can see all the moving parts right there. Here's an interesting one off of a, an old 1920s style British airplane. I forget which one it's off of, but it's got a spring in that little box at the top there. The yellow paddle pushes against the spring. And as your airspeed increases, the paddle pushes back against the speed at the bottom. Very simple. I suspect this kind probably changes its accuracy over time as the spring wears out or gets a little rusty. So now we're getting into the, the pneumatic instruments, the ones that strictly have to do with comparing air speeds. Uh, this one, uh, the first time I gave this seminar, the, one of my uh, attendees said that he found it on a bicycle website. Uh, the uh, logo at the bottom here makes me think it's probably also off of some sort of a hang glider. Here was an interesting one I found. I, I don't know what kind of airplane this came out of, but the spiral aspect of the indication really intrigued me. And uh, you'd have to, you probably know by the way the airplane is handling whether you're doing 35 knots or 135 knots, but your needle would be pointing in the same spot. Next, we have a, a good example of a, a basic multi engine aircraft uh, uh, airplane airspeed indicator. You can tell by the red line and the yellow line. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking primarily about a single engine airplane. Uh, but as airplanes change in complexity, the airspeed indicator has to change to be able to keep up with it. Here's a true airspeed indicator. You see the knob on the lower right corner is used to adjust your temperature to your pressure altitude. And then when the needle is, is down here at 120 miles per hour, you'll know that that's 122 knots and about 109 miles per hour. I'm sorry, 109 knots indicated, 120 miles per hour indicated. Uh, sorry, this image is a little bit blurry, but this one was intriguing to me. This is off of the Bell X-1 that's called Glamorous Glenis. This is the first airplane that went faster than Mach 1. Chuck Yeager flew this. And uh, it just has one hand that goes around it, but it goes past 90. And inside is the other, uh, the hundreds of miles per hour indicator. So just like a clock, it spins around and the internal dial will move around. Here's one off of a, a Boeing 767 flying along at about uh, 36,000 feet or so. This one, uh, it's a little bit different than what we're used to in our little airplanes. There's no colored markings around the outside. Uh, we have the barber pole that changes its position based on your altitude, changes from a VMO uh, as VMO decreases as you change altitude. The white bugs are used by the pilots to set various flap setting speeds and uh, approach reference speed. And the last example here, this is off of the Boeing 737-800 that I fly. Uh, I took this picture, so that's where I know its pedigree. Uh, it, this particular screen combines all the flight instruments together in one display. And on the left-hand side here is our airspeed tape, and it's got a lot of components to that. This at the top, the 0.78 is our, our selected mock speed for the auto throttle system. The magenta 
triangle here, the bug, shows what that is converted to as far as an airspeed is concerned. Inside the box is the speed that we're going. And the red zipper here is our limit speed, maximum limit speed. And the yellow hook at the bottom here is uh, when we start to experience the airframe buffet and uh, uh, stick shaker. More, way more complicated than the uh, airspeed we're going to be talking about tonight. Here's the one we're going to be talking about tonight. And this is off of a 152, very simple. You get the numbers around the outside, a single uh, indicator there with knots on the outside, miles per hour on the inside. Uh, the colored stripes all mean something, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Let's talk next about legalities. Why do we have to have an airspeed indicator in our airplane? We'll start with part 91. This is a list of equipment that you have to be equipped in your airplane to fly VFR flight rules during the day. And you see that the first thing on the list is an airspeed indicator. We'll go to part 23. And this is the regulation that governs how airplanes are constructed, manufactured. And this is a list of the instruments that have to be installed in your airplane. And you can see here that uh, the first thing again on this list is the airspeed indicator. And it looks like we got a question in here. Stand by and we'll see if we can get you an answer. It asks if we can increase the size of the mouse pointer. It would take us quite a while to do that. So I'm uh, sorry, you'll have to just bear with us on that one, Jim. Okay, the next one is a regulation we'll take a look at on how accurate the airspeed indicator needs to be. <laughs> We're not going to read this whole thing. There's a lot of words in there. Suffice it to say that the parameters and requirements for the airspeed indicator are pretty strictly spelled out. Uh, and this is to be dealt with by the manufacturers of the instruments and the airplanes as well. So uh, just know that there are rules out there about how it has to perform. What about inspections of your airspeed indicator? Any requirements for that? Here's the part 91 regulation you're used to. Then talk about altimeter system and altitude reporting. And this is the closest we get. But you'll notice it says altimeter system, altitude reporting equipment, and pressure altitude reporting system. Airspeed indicator is not included in this list. And the inspection that we have to get every two years for IFR operation is typically called a pedostatic inspection. But just be aware that your inspector who's conducting this inspection is not actually inspecting your pedo system. He's only looking at your static system. He does connect into the pedo system just because the pressures that they're applying to the system are big enough that it could cause damage to your airspeed indicator if the whole system wasn't at the same pressure. So let's segue a little bit here into how does it actually work. And here's the definition out of the FAA Instrument Flying Handbook. It's a differential pressure gauge, measures the dynamic pressure of the air through which it's flying. And the dynamic pressure is then later defined as the difference between the ambient static air pressure and the total or ram pressure is caused by the motion of the aircraft through the air. So if you put your hand out the window of your car and you can feel the air pressure, uh, pressing against your hand, that's ram pressure. And that's what this instrument is going to compare against to determine the indicated airspeed. Then I got to thinking, well, how much pressure are we talking about? And uh, this chart is a, a chart of the pressures that correspond to various speeds. So you can see we start out here pretty slow. It, 20 knots is only 1 one hundredth of a pound per square inch. So this is a very small amount and that's why your airspeed indicator doesn't start indicating until you start getting a little bit faster. Usually around 35, 40 knots it'll start to come alive. Uh, at 100 knots you have less than a quarter of a PSI. So we're talking very small pressures. And not until you get over 200 knots are you over even one PSI. So the takeaway from this is that we're talking about very small numbers. This is a very delicate instrument. I really don't recommend you blow into your pitot tubes. You can put a lot more pressure onto that and damage the mechanism inside the airspeed indicator. And then you'll find out how much an in airspeed indicator costs. So continuing this, uh, how does it work? In order to do this, we need to have a, a mental picture, at least, of, the, of how the pitot static system is all connected. So take a moment and imagine in your mind how all these instruments and sources are plumbed together. And here's what we've got. Here's our big giant pitot tube indicator or sensor over here. 
The red line is your pitot pressure that goes into your airspeed indicator. And then over here we have the static port on the side of the airplane. And that's plumbed, uh, pictured in blue. And you can see that the static is connected to all three of our pitot-static instruments, the altimeter, vertical speed, and airspeed. Most airplanes also have an alternate static source down here, selected one way or another. Uh, if it's an instrument rated airplane, instrument certified airplane, it has to have a pitot heater installed as well. So the mandatory parts are your static port, the instruments, and the pitot probe, and the plumbing to connect them all together. Here's a pitot tube. This happens to be the one on my 182. And that's a static port. The 182 has a static port on both sides of the fuselage. We'll talk about that just a little bit later on. So here's a, a conceptual diagram of how the airspeed indicator itself works. Uh, here's the indicator itself on the right. It's just a big box. We've got a static source that's plumbed inside to it. And we've got a pitot pressure that's plumbed to the inside of this aneroid capsule. And now th this is a very simplified diagram and it just says various linkages connecting that aneroid capsule up to the indicator on the right side. That's essentially all it is. This is a moving graphic of how it works and you can see as the pitot pressure inflates the aneroid inside it converts that to a, a rotary motion on the indicator needle which then points to the airspeed. So here's a, a little bit, um, a little bit more involved discussion of a diagram of the inside of the airspeed indicator, and you can see we've, uh, we've got the, di the uh, diaphragm here on the left. It's connected through the rocking shaft here, and that's the ankle bones connected to the leg bone, to the knee bone, and over to the indicator on the right. And stand by, we're gonna look at a question here. Uh, the question uh, from Alexis here is, what is the plumbing made of? Plastic, aluminum, or what? Most airplanes, certainly my small airplane, it's made of plastic. Uh, met the uh, metal ones probably, I'm guessing, would vibrate a little bit much. You might have a problem occasionally with, with some cracking of connections, but all the ones I've seen are plastic. So essentially here we get to, we got static pressure in, we got pitot pressure in, the difference moves the needle, and the needle indicates airspeed. So let's move over now to different kinds of airspeed. And uh, when I give the seminar live, I'll ask people what different kinds of airspeed we've got. Online, it's a little bit different. So here's our list. We've got indicated airspeed, calibrated airspeed, equivalent airspeed, and true. And I would venture to guess if you're a licensed pilot, you probably know at least three of the four of these. And we'll get into them just a, coming right up here. But if you remember ICE-T, that's your acronym. So we're lo looking into each one individually here, we have indicated airspeed, and this basically is the speed of the aircraft as observed on the airspeed indicator. So that's on the instrument, the face of the instrument, the number that the needle's pointing to. There's no correction for indicator errors, position errors, or compressibility of the air. It's just exactly what the needle says. It's the indicated. Move on to calibrated airspeed now, and we're gonna take that indicated airspeed and we're going to make some corrections for it based on position of the pitot tube or installation differences in your airplane and, and even instrument errors. Uh, some of the speeds in some airplane operating handbooks are designated in indicated airspeeds and some are calibrated. I've seen both types in various types of airplanes. So if you're going to do these sorts of conversions on some of the speeds we'll talk to in a little bit, you need to know which one you're working with and how to convert back and forth. We'll move on to equivalent airspeed, and this is the one that's probably new to some of you. Uh, if your airplane is a slower airplane below 200 knots or below about 10,000 feet, equivalent airspeed doesn't come into play very much. So here's the definition of equivalent airspeed. Is the, it's the airspeed at sea level at which the dynamic pressure is the same as the pressure at the altitude and speed that the airplane is flying. If you if you're flying at sea level, they're both the same. But if you're high and or you're fast, you need to make an adjustment for the calibration of the uh, of the indicator. So for us in our small airplanes, it doesn't matter. If you're designing a high-speed jet, you might want to know about that. Um, we will get into a little bit of the relationship between pitot and static pressure. Uh, this is another question we're answering here from Robert. 
Um, we'll touch on it a little bit. Check back with us at the end, and uh, if we didn't answer your question, then let me know, and, and we'll come back and get it. Okay, as your airspeed and altitude increase, calibrated airspeed becomes higher because the compressibility of the air changes, and we have to make an adjustment for that. And finally, we come to true airspeed. And this is pretty important to us flying our airplane for a host of reasons, uh, but this is the actual speed of the aircraft as it moves through the air, the speed of the molecules as they go by the wing. And they're, again, they're the same at standard atmosphere at sea level, so we make these adjustments uh, with temperature and pressure so that we can determine what our true airspeed is, and that's what we use for our flight planning. So here's the way you can remember they're connected. If you remember that iced tea is a pretty cool drink, indicated adjusted for position gives you calibrated, adjust that for compression gives you equivalent airspeed, and adjust that for density that changes it by temperature and altitude, and that gives you true airspeed. So let's talk a little bit now about V speeds. And they're all they're called V speeds just because they all start with a V. Strangely enough, here's a whole bunch of V speeds. These are ones you're probably familiar with. And uh, in a moment, here's a bunch of other V speeds that may have to do with types of airplanes that you've never seen or heard of before. Some of these I'm familiar with, and some of these I'm not. Here's a list of all the V speeds I could find. And uh, we're going to go through each one of these in turn. Uh, no, just kidding. Actually, we're going to look only at these purple ones here. These are the ones that we come into into uh, use mostly in our small airplanes. And uh, we're going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So back to our airspeed indicator. Uh, we talked earlier about the colored markings around the perimeter of it. And each of these is marked for a reason and shows us a different thing. We've got five different airspeeds that are marked on here, starting with here at the bottom of the white arc, bottom of the green, top of the white, top of the green, and then the red line. So here's what they all are. The, the VS0, VSO, is the stall speed in the landing configuration, bottom of the green. VS1 is in a specified configuration. And to determine what that specified configuration is, you'll need to read your pilot operating handbook. Usually it's in the landing configuration. Moving on now to the top of the white arc, this is VFE, and this is your max full flap speed. Some airplanes allow you to extend approach flaps, the first notch or uh, 10 degrees usually, for approach at a higher airspeed, but you can't put more than that uh, you can't select more flaps than that until you're within the white arc. Then we have the top of the green arc, or bottom of the yellow, is maximum structural cruising speed. And we'll take all these apart here in just a minute. And the red line, of course, is VNE never exceeds speed. And there they are all pointed out for you. So taking these each in, in turn, VSO, the bottom of the white arc, this is the stall speed in the landing configuration. And here's the definition out of the airplane flying handbook. You have to keep in mind that that speed is marked for the steady flight speed in the landing configuration at the maximum landing weight. And this is power off as well, power off stall speed. If any of those things changes, if you're accelerated by turning or if you're not in the landing configuration, you have some power or you're a lighter weight, your stall speed will be different. And this is frequently why when you practice slow flight, your airspeed indicator can be indicating below the bottom of the white arc. If you're doing it right, <laughs> in my opinion, that's where you should be, below the bottom of the white arc. And that's because you're carrying some power when you're doing that, and you're probably not at maximum landing weight. Bottom of the green arc, again, the stalling speed in the specified condition configuration. So for most airplanes, this is the power off stall speed in the clean configuration, so gear and flaps up. So this begs a question here, will an airplane always stall at these speeds? And I mentioned a moment ago, it's possible to be flying along below those speeds. So if you're lighter uh, or you're carrying some power, that extra breeze going over your wing is going to allow you to fly at a slower speed. Uh, conversely, if you're turning, in a level turn where you're maintaining altitude, you're going to be applying some g-force to the wing, and that's going to increase your your stall speed. Uh, so your airplane will stall at different speeds. 
and why not? And if, as it's changing like this, how do you really know when the airplane will stall? So we'll get into a couple of things here. The definition of a stall is just that the air is not flowing over the wing smoothly anymore, and it can't generate the lift that it generated when it was clean and unstalled. So the airflow starts to separate, and the lift deteriorates, and you have a stalled condition. This can happen at any airspeed, in any attitude, and any power setting. One of the things I like to do with clients is an accelerated stall. We'll put it into a 60 degree bank turn and maintain altitude. And what we end up doing in this case then is we raise the stall speed up to the flight, the speed that we're flying. So you can be well above the bottom of the green arc and the airplane will stall. We'll take a look now at the VFE, the max flap extended speed. That's the top of the white arc. And again, check your operating manual for your airplane. You may be allowed to use the first little bit of flaps. For instance, if you're doing an instrument approach sometimes, it helps with your drag configuration. Uh, but if you go faster than this with more flaps than that, you can cause stress and wear and damage to the flap mechanism. And of course, I probably don't need to tell you, the flap mechanism is an integral part of the wing. And damage and repair to this portion of your airplane can be very costly indeed. So. I personally don't want to find out how much that costs. I don't recommend you do either. Also, I like to wait until I'm a few knots below these, this speed before I'll even go to full flaps. I'll give it a, a good 10 or 15 knot cushion before I deploy more flaps than that. Just don't need to put that extra wear on your airplane. We'll move on to the VNO, the top of the green arc or the bottom of the yellow arc. This is sometimes called the normal operating speed and sometimes called the max, maximum structural cruising speed. They're the same thing. And uh, it's not a good idea to exceed this speed unless you're in smooth air. And we'll talk in just a little while about the, the flight envelope and some of the loads on the airplane. And finally, for depicted speeds, we have the red line or the top of the yellow arc. This is called your never exceed speed. And operation above this speed is prohibited could result in damage or structural failure. You're essentially a test pilot if you're going any speed above that. So let's dive into this VNE just a little bit. Does VNE change or is it always that red line at the top of your indicator? And the answer is it sort of does change. And why? Let's take a look at this. Why does it change? And VNE is all about airframe flutter margins on your airplane. And let me first confess, I'm not an aerodynamical engineer. Uh, I, I don't design or build airplanes, but this is what I've turned up in my research. Your airframe, airframe flutter margins are reduced at altitude. And uh, stand by, we got a, a fl flutter is based on the actual velocity of the air flowing past the airplane. And that was what we called the true airspeed a moment ago. It's not based on the dynamic pressure. OK, the question uh, we have is, are the POH speeds theoretical or tested values? In other words, how are these speed, these values determined? And they are tested values. Those are, they get a test pilot uh, from the airplane manufacturer. They actually fly the airplane at all corners of the envelope and determine how the airplane behaves. So uh, these speeds, at least, are not theoretical. Good question, Cliff. Thanks. Uh, so the, the true airspeed, the VNE is determined based on the true airspeed and not the dynamic pressure, not the indicated airspeed. So let's see how this works. Now, one of the things that the causes for this is at a higher altitude, there's less air there to act as a damper on the movement of a flight control surface. I'm going to show you an example here in a moment that's pretty dramatic. So why does VNE change? And uh, I did a little research and turned up, a, this guy had, had done some studies on this. And he was, if you consider an airplane with a turbocharged airplane that can maintain this horsepower all the way up to 24,000 feet. Meanwhile, he tested his airplane down at sea level. And he found that when he went 230 knots true airspeed in this airplane at sea level, he started the flutter. And that's what any person testing a, an airplane will do. They fly it until it does flutter, and then they back off of that for where your VNE is going to be. But here's what happens. If we start here at, at sea level, he's determined it, it, uh, it flutters at 230 knots. So if you're flying at 206 knots true and indicated, remember at sea level they're the same, he's got almost 24 knots of margin to get to his flutter airspeed. 
Now, if he comes up to 4,000 feet with the same power, his indicated airspeed goes down. Indicated airspeed will always decrease with altitude at the same power setting. So if he's looking at his flutter margin based on indicated airspeed, it looks like it's getting bigger. He's slowed down to 202 now. Airplane flutters at 230. Now he's got almost 28 knots of margin. He goes up to 8,000. He's indicating 198. He's got 32 knots of margin. So it looks like things are looking great, doesn't it? But if you look at the true airspeed, which is the speed of the molecules going past the wing, and this is what really matters when it comes to flutter, he goes up to 4,000. His true airspeed has increased to almost 215 knots. So now his margin is actually reduced to 15 knots. And continuing up to 8,000, now he's, his true airspeed is 223. He's down to less than seven knots of margin to, until the airframe starts to flutter. Somewhere before he gets to 12,000, he's over 230 knots. His margin has disappeared. Yet if he's looking at his airspeed indicator, everything still looks great. So this is why it's not always a great idea to hang a bigger engine on your home-built airplane. This particular pilot was a, a home builder and uh, did a little research once he found that his airplane did flutter at higher altitudes. He wanted to find out why, and he looked into it and came up with this chart. So I found an example of a wing flutter. This particular example was on a Hawker Sidley 125 um, small corporate jet. And there was a company that made aftermarket winglets for it. And when they first developed this, they had a little problem. They had some, a couple reports of some severe vibration and wing aileron oscillations due to a lack of sufficient flutter margin. Now, this was a slightly different thing. They were flying at, at permitted airspeeds, but they made a change to the wing. And that changed the way that the wing, uh, the flutter started. And as a result of that, they had to inc establish a maximum altitude for the airplane of flight level 340 or about 34,000 feet until they figured out what was going on. So let's take a look at the video here. That gave me the heebie-jeebies when I saw that. You see the whole airplane shaking. <laughs> Good question indeed. Can we land? And uh, so the answer is if you find this happening, if you can, slow down very gently. First reduce power, and hopefully that's enough to get the flutter to stop. Uh, but you don't want to make a hard pull on the elevator either. You could find yourself with parts departing the airframe. And you probably want to have an inspection done after this has happened. So we have moving on to some uh, additional speeds here. These are speeds that are not depicted on your airspeed indicator. And some of these are pretty important. You probably all have your VX and VY memorized for your airplane. And that's a good idea. Uh, maneuvering speed, best glide speed, these are all great speeds to know. But you also need to know how they change. So let's take a look at some of these. We'll look at VX. This is the best angle of climb. And if you fly at this airspeed, it's going to give you the most altitude gain in the shortest horizontal distance. So we use this most often if we're in a short field or obstructed field situation, and we want to make sure that we have the best chance of getting altitude over those obstacles right after takeoff. It's important to note here, and we're going to dive into this in a moment here, VX increases at higher altitudes. So your VX at 10,000 feet will be different than it is at sea level. Now VY is your best rate of climb airspeed. This is the most altitude in the shortest period of time. So for a given power setting and altitude, flying this speed will give you the highest indication possible on your vertical speed indicator. Once you clear the obstacles, it's a good idea to use this speed for the first portion of the climb at least to make sure that you give yourself a, a more altitude cushion back down to the ground and um, give yourself a better safety margin. And uh, here's a note on that one. The VY decreases with altitude. So while your VX is increasing, your VY is decreasing. Okay, and uh, Hang on just a second there, Gary. Advance to the next one. There you go. So I have to thank Rod Machado for this chart. He gave me a series of charts that just illustrate this beautifully. And this is called a rate of climb chart versus airspeed. 
So this top curve is your sea level climb rate. And across the bottom is the true airspeed in knots. So you can see here uh, at the top of the arc, if we drop that down, that's the highest rate of climb you can get. Drop that down and that gives us 76 knots. True airspeed for your best rate of climb. A couple other things are interesting about this. If you're below uh, whatever speed this is, about 42 knots, your airplane will not climb. Just not possible. Similarly over here on the high speed end, if you're more than about 135 knots, you don't have enough power to go any faster, you will not be able to climb. And here's the thing with the rate of climb. I learned when I made this this presentation. Here's how the best uh, angle of climb rather, how the best angle of climb is determined. You draw a tangent line from zero at an angle just down until it touches this curve, the tangent to this curve. You drop down and that's your best angle of climb speed. So you can see that you can climb a little bit higher rate if you go a little faster, but you'll also be farther away from your starting point over here. But if you climb at this airspeed at 59 knots, you get the most altitude before you get to the obstacles. And we'll come back to this in just a moment, but here's your curves for 5,000, here's your curve for 10,000. So let's see what happens with both of these speeds as we climb. So we draw a tangent line against each of those curves, and you can see here at sea level, our best angle is 59. Come up here to 5,000 feet, and our best angle has increased now to 69 knots. And if we come up here to 10,000 feet, our tangent line finds us at 77 knots. So your best angle of climb is increasing constantly as we climb. And if we look at the top of this curve, your best rate of climb airspeed, you'll see that it's also increasing Tr by true airspeed. It increases 76 from sea level, 77 at 5,000 feet, and 82 at 10,000 feet. So if we graph these out together, connect all the dots, here's our VX numbers and here's our VY numbers. We'll take those numbers and we'll graph them just a little bit differently. We'll put the true airspeed across the bottom and your altitude. So this shows us how these speeds change based on your altitude. And you can see again VX increasing and VY is increasing. But didn't I say a moment ago that VY decreases with airspeed? And here's the key. This is based on true airspeed. And those numbers change by indicated airspeed, which is what we more are more likely to care about because it's what we see in front of our face as we're flying the airplane. So if we just adjust the graph now and you adjust them for indicated airspeed, you'll see now clearly that VX increases and VY decreases as you climb. So to sum up the differences in VX and VY, VX is your climb per distance, VY climb per time, VX is slower, VY is faster, VX increases with altitude, VY decreases with altitude. So let me pose another question for you here. What happens when VX equals VY? What's that called? Most people will say this is the service ceiling, uh, but it's actually the absolute ceiling. That's where those two lines meet. This diagram is out of the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. Service ceiling is just a little bit lower than that. And the service ceiling is the altitude where you can still maintain a 100 feet a minute rate of climb. So above the service ceiling, you can still go just a little bit longer, not more than 100 feet a minute. So it's going to take you a long time to climb anymore above your best angle. A uh, question here is coming in from David. Just wondering how I would develop this chart for my particular aircraft. Really the only way to do it is to do it experimentally and uh, go grab these airspeeds for yourself and climb rates for yourself. And that's the best thing. Uh, you get the charts in the manual that are uh, developed by test pilots and so forth. And the best thing is just to do it yourself and get your own numbers. Every airplane is different. Every pilot is different. Good question. Thanks for that one. So here's my recommended climb profile at any airplane, in any airplane anywhere. If you've got obstacles, use VX right after takeoff until you're clear of them. Once you're clear of obstacles, I like to accelerate then to VY, your best rate of climb, until I get to 1,000 feet. Once I'm at 1,000 feet, now I lower the nose a little bit and until I get a 500 foot a minute climb rate. And I maintain that constant rate of climb airspeed 
which will be decreasing as I climb until my airspeed in equals the best angle of or best rate of climb airspeed. Once you get to best rate of climb, I climb at that, and remember it's still going to be decreasing, and I climb at Vy until it equals Vx. And remember what happened when Vy equaled Vx? You're done. That's as high as you're going to get that day. And obviously you'll stop here at any point if you've reached the altitude that you want to cruise at before you've, you get to the next step. So let's take another look at this, uh, the effect of altitude on VX. This is very important if you fly around high elevation airports. And here in Southern California, Big Bear Airport is one of our favorites. It's up at 6,800 feet. So its curve is going to be somewhere around here. But if we look at VX, remember at sea level, we determined that it was at 59 knots. At 5,000 feet, it's at 69 knots. Now, if you're going to fly your sea level VX while you're at 5,000 feet, if you follow that line down here, 59 knots is right about here, you'll only be doing 400 feet a minute climb and you'll be well lower than what your airplane was capable of being. This is why it's a good idea to check in your manual and research what the best angle of climb airspeed is for your airplane at your altitude. So let's take a look now at maneuvering speed, VA. This is the maximum speed at which full abrupt pitch control inputs can be made without exceeding the design load factor. And below this speed, your, air, your wing is going to stall, which naturally will unload the wing before the wing structure is subjected to the limit load factor. So let's take a look at a diagram here. This is called a VG diagram. You got your V, your airspeed along the bottom axis. You've got your G, your load factor along the left side. And you've probably heard about pushing the edges of the envelope. If you imagine this portion of the diagram right here is kind of shaped like an envelope. If you rotate it 90 degrees, it comes up to a point on the left side here. That's your flight envelope, your normal flight envelope. So if you're pushing an edge of the envelope over here, you're pulling G's. On this line right here, we're pulling four G's. If you're going too fast, you're pushing this end, end of the envelope, the right end. And there's also a, a structural damage here that happens at negative G's. I think myself, my eyeballs will pop out of my head before I cause any damage on the airplane there. And if you've heard of the back side of the envelope, back side of the power curve, that happens over here below as you approach stall speed or even lower. Um, as your drag increases so much, it takes more power. So we're interested here in maneuvering speed, which is this top corner here. And you can see if you're pulling say three G's, you, you pull the airplane, pull it, pull it, pull it. When you get to the accelerated stall, that's where it's going to stall and the, air, the nose will naturally drop and unload. But if you're flying, and that's if you're flying here at say 120 knots. If you're flying up here at 160 knots and you pull, pull, pull and you increase your G's, you're going to get to this structural damage portion of the envelope before you get to the part where your wing is going to stall. So that's why this speed here where the structural damage G load meets the accelerated stall point speed, you don't want to go any faster than that if you're in turbulence, for instance. Now, one of the reasons they don't mark VA on your airspeed indicator is because it changes based on your weight. If you're at a lighter weight, your airspeed, your VA speed is lower. Most of us fly our airplanes below max gross takeoff weight, so our VA maneuvering speed will be lower than normal. Here's the formula, there's a bunch of fancy math here, square root of the actual weight over the maximum weight times your original speed. So in my airplane, and you don't have to get this technical all the time, I'm going to give you a simpler version here in a moment. 111 is my published uh, VA at 2,950 pounds. So if I'm at 2,700 pounds instead, we plug those numbers into the, the formula there, and it's about 106 knots. And in my manual, these speeds are all uh, converted to calibrated airspeed. So here's another way to look at it. If your VA is reduced by half of the percentage below max gross weight. So in my example there, 2,700 feet is about 8.5% below the max. So half of that, about 4.2% of 11, 111 knots is 5 knots. So you do the math, and it comes out at 106. Same number. For a rule of thumb, it's about 2 knots per 100 pounds below your max gross weight. So uh, if you're 
200 pounds below, or in, in my case, 250 pounds below gross weight, that's a five knot adjustment. And once again, it comes out to 106. So this is probably the easiest one to remember, and you don't have to have a PhD in math to do it before you go fly. So let's take a look at best glide speed now. This is a number, num another number that you probably have committed to memory for your airplane. And this gives you the best lift over drag, the furthest distance available given a no wind and no power situation. So glider pilots will know this as, as the L over D speed, best L over D. Uh, I'm not a glider pilot. I've flown a little bit of glider and it's a tremendous experience. I recommend it highly. But this is the lowest ratio of sink rate to airspeed. And let's take a look in a moment about how we find that. Any other speed means that you won't be able to glide as far. You might be able to stay in the air longer, but you won't get any farther than you would at your best glide speed. It is different than the minimum sink speed. And these are different in the same way that VX and VY are different. And here's a chart that shows it. This one's a little blurry here, but here's your VMP or V, uh, v minimum sink speed. That's the top of this sink rate curve. We have our airspeed over here and our sink rate on the left side. So your VMP is right at the top end of this, and that's going to give you the lowest sink rate. But the and the VBG, your best glide speed, takes into account distance. So once again, here's our tangent line from the origin. Lean it right up against tangent to our curve. And that airspeed right here is going to give you that sink rate. So it's a little bit higher sink rate, but you're going to go farther. So the net result is you have more options of where to put your airplane in this situation. That speed is only that speed in a zero wind condition. But I usually find myself with a headwind. and Maybe some of you are luckier and get tailwinds more often. But if, you're, if your field is ahead of you into a headwind, that VBG may not be the best speed for you. So the trick is you want to speed up if you're flying into a headwind and slow down if you've got a tailwind. The idea is to get out of the headwind faster or stay in the tailwind a little bit longer and take advantage of that extra push. So here's a rule of thumb for you. If you know that the wind is, say, 20 knots, subtract half of it and fly your VBG as 10 knots faster. Or if you've got a 20 knot tailwind, subtract about a quarter of that tailwind or about five knots from your published VBG. That gets you very, very close. And let's see how that works. Here's our, our uh, descent rate curve again. Uh, this one doesn't have the horizontal there, but here's our, our best glide speed is this red dashed line where it runs tangent to the, air or to the uh, curve, go up and that's our airspeed. Now, if we have a headwind instead, that's the same as moving our airspeed over to the right just a little bit. So we draw a new tangent line from that point to the curve, and where that touches is right about this point. We follow that up, and you see that that distance right there between the red dashed line and the purple line is about half of the size of the headwind adjustment we made. And if we go the other way, we've got a tailwind that's pushing us along. We could draw a the, we just move the origin of our tangent line to the, the value of the air the uh, wind speed that we have and where that runs tangent to the curve that's our new best glide speed for the tailwind and you look at that distance between the, the red dash line and the sort of greenish line and that's about one fourth of this tailwind line and similarly if you're in sinking air you can move your, your uh, origin line up and see that you really need to speed up if you're in sinking air uh, there have been in uh, accidents caused by airplanes not getting out of sinking air quickly enough. So let's take a look at the way that some of these fail and actually just a moment here we're going to take a quick look at a question. How would you fly off a test program for VBG? Uh, next time you're with your instructor or you can even do this by yourself it's not a difficult thing to do just bring the power back to idle. I, I don't recommend shutting your engine off so your numbers will be close but a little bit different than a, an engine failure situation. But just fly at different airspeeds. Say every five knots, uh, you're cruising, let's say, at 110 knots. So once you stabilize and trim it for that airspeed, just write down what your descent rate is. Now slow down another five knots and stabilize there and get it trimmed and write down that airspeed and slow down another five and so forth. Now you've got your descent curve. And we're not worried at this point about your best glide or anything like this. We just want to find out what the descent rates are in this configuration. Now don't try to do this in the airplane. You do that part in the airplane. 
once you've gathered all that data, you come back home and you draw yourself a graph and you'll find a curve that looks very much like that curve that we just looked at a moment ago. Now you can draw your own tangent lines on there and determine what those speeds are for yourself. Great question, thanks. So we'll take a look now at some of the ways that the airspeed indicator can fail. And before we do that, here's our diagram of the system again. So keep in mind, we've got our static system is connected to all three instruments and our pitot system is connected only to the airspeed indicator. And we've also got our alternate static source, don't forget that. So here was an accident report I found, the airplane that on the takeoff roll, everything looked okay, but by 50 knots, the airplane feels like it's about to jump off the ground, it's ready to go. But the airspeed indicator is still too slow. So he rotates and takes off and he wants to accelerate to his best rate of climb airspeed, but the airspeed indicator wouldn't go above 55 miles or 55 knots. So he pulled it, but it feels like he's going much faster than that. So he pulls up and tries to pitch for the airspeed, but the speed stayed at 55 knots and is handling like it's going much faster. So he, again, pushed the nose down to try to speed up, but it won't go any higher. So now he's pretty sure he's got something wrong with his airspeed indicator. So think about that for a moment. And what do you think happened? Our pilot looked out the left window and his heart sank. What did he see? Yep, left the pedo cover on. So in his situation, and this is my pedo cover on my airplane, I don't know what kind he had, but you can see in mine, it's kind of a loose fitting thing. Who knows what that air is gonna do as it goes into that, that uh, strap. It could move around in all sorts of strange ways and give you all kinds of weird indications. Other pedo covers will mount in a more, uh, uh, more sealed condition and you might not register any pressure at all. So let's take a look at the next one. This one happened out here in Santa Monica just a couple of years ago. Student pilot on a cross country after takeoff. Airspeed indicator showed an increase and then a decrease to zero. So uh, yep, airspeed indicator is not working. He told the tower, made a good decision to turn back around and land at his home airport. Uh, on final approach, the airplane was higher than normal. He wasn't going to make the runway. He gets a quarter of it remaining and uh, still is not on the ground. Air traffic control suggested that he do a go around and he did that. Unfortunately, he didn't maintain control of the airplane, impacted trees in a house. So let's see what happened here. They took the airplane apart, looking around in there, and they found there was debris in the pitot tube, soil and insect material. So how many times have you heard that mud daubers like to make nests in pitot tubes? And it's true, and this unfortunate pilot uh, found that out the hard way. Moving on to the next one, you probably have heard about this one, very famous Air France 447. Uh, this accident started with an airspeed indicator failure that was caused by a simultaneous failure of the heater systems in all three pitot probes. So they were flying through a weather system, it was very wet and it was very cold, and all three pitot tubes froze over and they lost all of the indicators. And a whole bunch went on after that that's not germane to it. This accident began with an airspeed indicator failure. So here's another one. Our pilot departed to do touch and go landings. He uh, noticed on his downwind leg that the airspeed indicator showed zero. And uh, afterwards, they did some tests on it and they found that uh, during the takeoff roll, it was fine. Everything was fine until the airplane got to about 400 feet above the ground, at which time it would show zero. So think back about that diagram that we looked at a moment ago on the pedostatic system. And uh, what do you think was the problem here? It turned out a couple of days before the flight, somebody had come out here to wash the airplane. One person put tape over the static ports, another person washed the airplane, and neither one of them removed the tape. The pilot flying the airplane during the pre-flight inspection didn't realize that the tape was on the static port, didn't find it, and he didn't remove them. Uh, they also noted in the accident report that he did not activate the equipped alternate static source. You'll probably hear that term again. Uh, so uh, let me go back to that one just a second. My advice here is anytime you put tape over the static system on the airplane, put a big gigantic sign on the instrument panel of your airplane saying static ports disabled so that the next guy getting in the airplane knows that this has been done. And if you see that sign on the airplane, don't go fly the airplane until you've taken care of the situation. Okay, here's another one. The pilot uh, received an IFR clearance. 
airplane performed an intersection takeoff at night with winds gusting to 30 knots and blowing snow. What could possibly go wrong? Just prior to rotation, he said he observed the airspeed indicator showing zero. That day. So if it was showing zero, how did he know he was just prior to rotation is what I wonder. But in any case, he elect, elected to continue the takeoff. He believed that insufficient runway removed to conduct an, a successful aborted takeoff. So he continued. Uh, after takeoff, he said the other instruments were not functioning properly. So his, al his altimeter and his vertical speed weren't working right either. And he ran into a tree. So they got to the wreckage the next day or maybe even later that night, and they found that there was a trace of ice on the wing's leading edge. One of the static ports was iced over, and the other one was destroyed in the accident. So the alternate static source was, was not found turned on. It was in a standby position. There's that word again, alternate static source. So the pilot said he survived the accident. He said, I figured I could use the alternate static source once I was up high enough to clear the trees. Well, he never got above the trees because he didn't control the airplane with the failures of his instruments. Might have saved the day. So here's another one. Um, this one, uh, the pilot was, uh, he did his pre-flight. Everything looked good. Run up looked good. He got his clearance. He takes off and at 400 feet MSL, he's in the clouds. He continues climbing, and pretty soon now the vertical speed indicator decreased to zero. And then it increased to 2,000 feet a minute. And then back to zero. So what the heck is going on here? Uh, moments later, the altimeter began bouncing with very large deflections. Then the attitude indicator did not agree with the turn coordinator. Honestly, I'm not sure what those have to do with this particular condition, but let's take a look at what happened to the altitude and airspeed system. He did not, again, he did not activate the alternate static source. And that was a, a part of the procedure in the POH. He told the controller that he was losing gauges and he would be unable to execute an ILS approach to the departure airport. So he activated the caps and descended into the trees. So what they found, oh, caps, in, in case you're not aware, it's a, called the Cirrus airframe parachute system. And this is the parachute that's built into a, a Cirrus SR-20 or SR-22. Kind of the last resort when things are going wrong, you're not sure you can get the airplane back on the ground. You would activate this system, and the airplane will descend on a parachute. So they tested the system to 1,000 feet, and everything was kind of crazy. The uh, VSI fluctuated all over the place, altimeter all over the place, airspeed, uh, and they did not return to zero. And they then pressurized the pitot line to 100 knots, and the airspeed was found to be sticking. Okay. Um, testing of the pitot-static system revealed no discrepancies uh, when they used the alternate air system. So again, there's that alternate air system. Okay. When in they uh, completed the investigation, they found a teaspoon of water, just a teaspoon of water, between the static port openings and the alternate static air valve in the static lines. It doesn't take much. Uh, they also checked this water, and they found that it was fluoridated water, which means it came out of a water supply and not rain. So they probably did not tape the static ports over to wash this airplane. But the, uh, the whole pitot-static system was erratic due to water contamination and the pilot's failure to take the appropriate corrective actions. The checklist said to pull the alternate static, and he didn't do it. So uh, alternate static check. Uh, this one actually just happened today, earlier today, to a friend of mine out on the East Coast. He posted this on one of our pilot forums. He does an alternate static check on every flight. So he pulls the alternate static, and normally you'll see the altimeter and the vertical speed will bump a little bit and then come back down to normal. And when you turn it back off again, they do the reverse. They bump a little bit and then come back to normal. But in his case today, it made a slow rise up to 500 foot a minute and then back down. So he's thinking, well, it's a VFR day. Let's go flying anyway and see what happens. He also has a, a pilot rated friend with him in the other seat. So during takeoff, the airspeed's everywhere between 49 to 66 knots. He's flying a Cessna 172. Very nice 172, I might add. So they, during the course of the flight, they, normal, they noted anomalies in airspeed, climb rate, altimeter, and everything. At one point, they had 147 knots in level flight. Who flying a 172 doesn't want to see that? Uh, he pulled the alternate static, and things returned to almost normal. Still a little mixed up, but more normal than they had been. 
So they make a good decision. They go back to the airport. They roll into the shop. Mechanic comes out, pokes around a little bit, doesn't see anything. They go out to lunch, and while they're out to lunch, they get a call. And the uh, A&P found a really small worm had made its way into the static plumbing through the static port, passed the water trap all the way to just before the alternate static port and laid a bunch of eggs and clogged the system up. thought that was really interesting. I'd never heard of a situation like that, and I thought it was, was really a, a cool story, a successful story. He got back down, he used the alternate static source, and he was successful. And it also helped that it was a VFR day flight deck. So here's one. Uh, this one happened to me. I was flying a Cessna 340, a turbocharged pressurized piston twin. Takeoff and climb were normal. Until shortly after takeoff, the airspeed indicator increased, VSI, the vertical speed, zeroed, and the altimeter showed field elevation. So that was a little bit weird. I was fairly low still, so I had to continue climbing. And as I climbed, my airspeed started decreasing. But I knew what the pitch and power settings were. I knew what it should look like, and it was day VFR, so I had that going for me. Um, and everything, it looked right, but the, in, the flight instruments were not indicating right. So I selected alternate static, and that didn't do anything. So then I thought, well, let me depressurize the airplane. So I turned the pressurization system off, and everything returned to near normal. It showed a little bit higher altitude and a little bit higher airspeed, but they started to function some more. So obviously I turned back around. This was a test flight, so I, I wasn't going anywhere. Came right back to the airport, uh, had the mechanic take another look at things, and they had just done the uh, static system test, and they left the static line disconnected from the back of the altimeter. They forgot to reconnect it. So the entire static system now is reading cabin pressure instead of static pressure on the outside of the airplane. And that pretty much explains all the, the symptoms I saw. I did later hear about an accident in the same type of airplane with this virtually the identical condition uh, that was a fit, turned into a fatal crash, and that, that one happened on a, a day IFR flight. So they took off into an overcast, didn't have the advantage of having a, a horizon to fly, and uh, unfortunately things didn't work out for them. So uh, we had a question here on uh, does best glider speed equal max range airspeed? We'll get to that in a little bit. So let's look at another one here is a, if the pitot tube is disconnected. I didn't find any accident or incident reports on this condition. So we'll just have to th think through this logically. If the pitot pressure is showing sea level or whatever the cabin is pressurized to, as the static pressure outside decreases. So our pitot pressure is increasing or is staying the same while the static pressure decreases. So as we climb, we would expect to see increasing airspeed and the airspeed air indicator will essentially behave like an altimeter does. So, and back to our chart with pressures versus airspeeds at a thousand feet, that's about an inch of mercury or a little less than, than a half of a pound per square inch. So at a thousand feet, we'd see a speed of around 150 knots. So if you're, if you're having a problem with your airspeed indicator or any part of your pedostatic system, the appropriate action, the first thing is if you're on the ground, abort the takeoff. If your airspeed doesn't register, and you should have an idea of the rule of thumb, you should have 70% of your takeoff speed before you reach 50% of the runway, and you should know what those numbers are, and if you haven't attained that speed by the halfway point of the runway, abort the takeoff. Um, and if you're in flight, use the alternate static source and see if that solves the problem. If it doesn't, you might need to think a little bit more, and if you're in a pressurized airplane, consider depressurizing and see if that has a, a beneficial effect for you. That's the static port selector on my 182. A little bit hard to see. It's pretty much directly under the yoke, uh, just a little bit left of my right knee. And it's sort of out of view while you're sitting in the seat. So make sure you can reach it, make sure you know where it is. In the uh, POH for your airplanes, certainly in mine, uh, some of the older airplanes might not have these kinds of charts, but there's a calibration chart you can look up in here. So if you're using the alternate static source, flying along say it flaps up and you're indicating 110 knots that your your normal speed would be 110 knots you'll actually be indicating 112 instead and then they give you the chart for other flap settings when you get closer to approach so look up that chart if you don't have one you could probably experimentally go out and determine these speeds in your own airplane so uh, if you don't have an alternate static should you break the vertical speed indicator 
Uh, I'm not going to tell you what to do because different vertical air vertical speed indicators work in a different way. But the idea is that you want to at least get cabin pressure into your static system. Part of the problem is that that usually goes through a, a small calibrated leak. And so there would be a delay in the static pressure that reaches your other instruments. And it may not be accurate. Okay, let's see. We have another question here. Um, the, the question from Ronald is, in all these cases, having a GPS like ForeFlight and such would at least have helped out. Yes, I think it would. At least it gives you a proxy for your speed, uh, give you a rough idea of what you're doing. Uh, may, even better might be some of the more modern AHARS units, the uh, Stratus 2, for instance, or the I-Level, uh, which is a, a full-on AHARS system. The thing to remember, though, those are uh, the AHARS will give you sort of an airspeed. The GPS will give you a ground speed. So probably close enough, probably close enough to get you on the ground in one piece, but not precise. So let's take a quick look at whether your airplane has single ports and uh, versus double um, static ports. And let's see. Oh, uh, the question was asked, not sure what break the VSI means. And what I mean by that is some people recommend, some people recommend uh, on the uh, face of the instrument, there's a glass disc that covers the needle and the numbers. If you put some sort of a tool in there and gently break that, that allows a cabin air to enter into the, the, the case of the instrument, that that will return some static, static error into your pitot-static system. Hopefully that answers your question. So back to the single port versus dual port. Here's an airplane with a single port on one side. Just real quickly, if you're flying along straight, you see that the air lines, the, the lines of air flowing past the airplane are parallel to the, the port. Everything's good. But if you're flying in a slip, for instance, with the wind coming from the left, that port is on the leeward side, the downwind side of the airplane, and it's probably going to measure a lower pressure. So that will show as a higher altitude or a climb or a higher airspeed. If you're on the other side, you're going to get a little positive pressure into it, and you'll see a lower altitude and a slower airspeed. If you have dual ports flying along, both ports on each side of the, the one on each side of the airplane average out. You get the average of the two. So no matter whether you have a slip from the left or the right, the average is the same and accurate. So if you remember, in the case of an airspeed indicator failure, pitch plus power equals performance. And you can look in your manual or you can find this experimentally. If you set a, a certain pitch attitude and a power setting, you will get a certain climb rate and a certain airspeed. And this is something uh, instrument pilots should do as uh, part of the beginning of your training or anytime you buy a new airplane, you should determine what certain power settings are for your airplane in certain configurations. And this just takes this a little bit step further to determine what the power settings would be, for instance, on final approach. So speaking of that, this is a chart I use in the 737 I fly. Uh, we have these numbers for a case of a unreliable airspeed indicator. Let's say we weigh 140,000 pounds and we're doing a 30 flap landing. If we set the pitch attitude at one degree above the horizon and we set the engine speed at 58%, this is going to give us a, our approach reference speed uh, for 30 flaps plus 10 knots. And we can interpolate this, interpolate it as we need to. And this will follow you. Uh, if you're in the gear down configuration, this will take you right down a three degree glide slope. So it's a good idea to find these numbers for yourself in your own airplane. So these are the kinds of failures we've looked at, at least briefly. So again, if you have an airspeed indicator failure and you realize it on takeoff, you might want to think about rejecting that takeoff. If you're in the air, I recommend you declare an emergency, certainly if you're in IMC. If you're an instrument pilot in the clouds, I think a loss of a primary flight instrument is a bona fide emergency. Select the alternate static source. Maybe that'll have a good a good solution for you. Maybe it's a, a problem in the static system that's fixed by doing this. Fly your known pitch and power combinations to get you to the back down to the ground. Ideally, you can find good weather and divert to a VFR airport. Also, anytime you've had any maintenance done, anytime you've had a, a pitot static check done or any work on, behind the panel, Make sure that first test flight after your, the maintenance is done during day VFR. And finally, practice uh, with an instructor or by yourself. Practice setting these power settings, flying these pitch attitudes, 
and see what performance you get out of your airplane. So here's what we've covered, a little history, why we have one. We're told we have to have one. Uh, we learned a little bit about how it works, what it's telling you, and some things that happen when they break. So here's a, a bunch of the references I've, I've taken. Earlier we had the question about some reading material. The, the materials on this book are excellent places to start. The Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge is a great, great tool all the way through your training and flying. I refer to mine quite frequently. Uh, the Airplane Flying Handbook, and if you're an instrument pilot, the Instrument Flying Handbook, that should be at least stored on your iPad somewhere with all your bookmarks in it. Uh, the AIM, the FAR, is always lots of good regs in there. We touched on some of those. Uh, if you're interested in a little bit more in-depth reading, the Aerodynamics for Naval Aviators, it probably takes a PhD in aerodynamics to understand everything in that manual, but there are certain sections you read them a few times and you'll probably get some, some good information out of it. Also, uh, Rod Machado has got a great article I found there, Why VX and VY Change with Altitude. And uh, he, again, uh, loaned me those charts to use in there. So thanks very much for that, Rod. I appreciate that. Uh, Ken Kruger uh, wrote an article of flying high and fast. He's the one who came up with the information on the, the power settings and airspeeds versus um, flutter margins at altitude. So... Thank you very much for watching. A little bit more information about me. There's my email address if you'd like to get in touch with me and the Pilot Safety Institute that Gary told you all about at the very beginning. Got phone numbers, website, Facebook pages, all there for all sorts of information. So uh, before we get a little bit more in depth in the questions, please remember that you'll receive an email tonight uh, asking you to complete a survey on the seminar, on the webinar rather, and uh, Wings Credit will be automatically issued tomorrow. And if you check on that uh, pilotsafety.org website right there tomorrow afternoon, there will be a link to rewatch this webinar and a whole bunch of other great safety information. So moving on with the questions. Okay, we'll stay on. Uh, we've got about 10 more minutes to stay on uh, and answer some of the questions here. So uh, if we don't get to you, please send me an email there and I'll try to get back to you. So Douglas answers, how does best glide speed equals max range airspeed? Uh, let me take that one first. Uh, they're a little bit different, but they have a lot in common. Uh, you're, you're not interested in descent rate, for instance. Uh, there's a great article or a concept, I believe it's called the Cunningham speed, about your best range speed based on the airspeed or the wind speed that you're flying into and out of. And that airspeed will be different. The range speed will be different based on the wind that you've got, your headwind or tailwind. Uh, your endurance airspeed will not be. That's always the same because endurance, you're talking about time. and range, you're talking about distance. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this webinar to include the, the whole discussion on max range airspeed. That's probably a, a whole different webinar by itself. Uh, does minimum sink airspeed equal best endurance airspeed? Uh, very close, Doug. What you're looking for is the, the bottom um, of the power curve where you're, you're burning the least amount of fuel to, to make your way. And hopefully that answers your question. Next one uh, from John. Regarding aircraft approach categories dictate circling MDA radius, are those speeds based on indicated or ground speed? Uh, that's a good question for the instrument pilots. Uh, they're based on indicated airspeed, um, and that's because that is what's going to affect your, your effective turning radius of the airplane. Uh, using category B or C, for instance, my you could fly an approach in my 182 in a category A that's based in, on indicated airspeed. Normally, I fly a little faster than 90 knots, usually 100 knots or so. So I use category B, and again, that's on indicated airspeed. Okay, from Robert. Uh, what is the best procedure to adjust temperature on, I think you said ASI. So determine your temperature uh, that you plug into the airspeed indicator, I believe is what you're asking for the adjustment to get to the true airspeed. And if you look, every airplane has, I believe every airplane has to have an OAT gauge, an outside air temperature gauge. That's the best one to use. So just take that number and plug that in your, your airspeed indicator if you have an, one that adjusts for it or into your E6B uh, airspeed conversion. Thanks so much, Mike. Steve, you're very welcome. Thanks so much for attending and look forward to seeing you on the next one. And uh, from David, great session. Well, thank you. I'm glad you like it. And Robert says, nearly impossible to fail three pitot heaters at the same time. However, if all three are underpowered for supplying heat to the service, they will make all three fail at the same time. Um, 
and we get into yes there was a defined uh, uh, design defect on the airspeed indicators I believe that defect was known at the time of the accident and there was uh, an AD or the equivalent for the airline industry um, and they hadn't quite changed all the pedo probes on that airplane is, is my understanding outstanding session well thank you very much William and uh, my friend Dave there from Iowa, second the great session. Thanks very much, Dave. Can an airspeed failure or false reading occur while flying through rain, mist, or snow from Alexis? Uh, so is this due to moisture going through the pitot tube and or the static port? I'm not aware of any failures. Um, the moisture that comes in through the, the pitot probe, remember, is working to pressurize the aneroid that's inside the instrument. The water doesn't usually make it all the way back into the instrument. Um, it could come back a little ways in the bottom of most pedo probes there is a drain tube and if that clogs up if the heater isn't working if you forgot to turn the heater on that could come back and, and block that up and then you could run into some failure modes um, and is this due to moisture through the pedo or static mostly the, the pedo probe because of static the air is just going by it not into it uh, James great refresher thank you I thought so uh, Walt what about density altitude the, well, that's a whole separate issue on the altimeter. We didn't get into that. Suffice it to say that we had adjusted for altitude and temperature to get true airspeed. Those were the two adjustments we made to get from calibrated airspeed to true airspeed. Someday I'll do a seminar on the altimeter. Uh, the defect was in the probes, not the airspeed indicators on Air France. Yes, that's true. Does your plane have two static ports, one on each side? Yes, my, my airplane does. Most airplanes do. Most instrument rated airplanes do. Your average 150 does not. Um, some 172s do. I've, I've seen 172s that did. Uh, James, very important, informative. Good, I'm glad you liked it. And will the pitot heater on affect airspeed indication from Edward? No, there's no adjustment for that. Um, so it's the same. Stuart learned much more than I expected about the airspeed indicator. Glad uh, glad you said that, Stuart. I did too. When I started this project, I figured this it would be maybe a 15-minute talk. And here we are, an hour and 20, and uh, still going. So <laughs> there is way more to it than I thought too. And Alexis, uh, compliments again. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, look for me. I'll be in the front left seat of the 737 when you least expect it. So uh, thanks again, everybody. And we'll see you next time around.